Newtonian determinism says that the universe is a clock, a gigantic clock that's wound up at the beginning of time, and it's been ticking ever since according to Newton's laws of motion. So, what you're going to eat 10 years from now, on January 1st, has already been fixed. It's already known using Newton's laws of motion. Einstein believed in that. Einstein was a determinist. Does that mean that a murderer, this a horrible mass murderer, isn't really guilty of his works because it was already preordained billions of years ago. And Einstein said, well, yeah, in some sense that's true. Even mass murderers were predetermined, but he said they should still be placed in jail. Heisenberg then comes along and proposes the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and says, nonsense. There's uncertainty. You don't know where the electron is. It could be here, here, or many places simultaneously. This, of course, Einstein hated because he said God doesn't play dice with the universe. Well, hey, get used to it. Einstein was wrong. God does play dice. Every time we look at an electron, it moves. There's uncertainty with regards to the position of the electron. So what does that mean for free will? It means in some sense we do have some kind of free will. No one can determine your future events given your past history. There's always the wild card. There's always the possibility of uncertainty in whatever we do. So when I look at myself in a mirror, I say to myself, what I'm looking at is not really me. It looks like me, but it's not really me at all. It's not me today, now. It's me a billionth of a second ago, because it takes a billionth of a second for light to go from me to the mirror and back. I'm not arguing that consciousness is a reality beyond science or beyond the brain or, or that, that it's, it floats free of the brain at death. I'm not, I'm not making any spooky claims about its, its metaphysics. Uh, what I am saying, however, is that uh, the self is an illusion, the sense of being an ego, an I, a thinker of thoughts in addition to the thoughts, a, a, an experiencer in addition to the experience, that the sense that we all have of riding around inside our heads as a uh, kind of a passenger in the vehicle of the body, that's, that's where most people start when they, when they think about any of these questions. Most people don't feel identical to their bodies. They feel like they have bodies. They feel like they're inside the body, and most people feel like they're inside their heads. Uh, now, that sense of being a subject, a locus of consciousness inside the head, is an illusion. That is, it makes no neuroanatomical sense. There's no place in the brain for your ego to be hiding. We know that, that everything you experience, your, your conscious emotions and thoughts and and moods and uh, the, the impulses that initiate behavior, all of these things are uh, delivered by, by myriad different processes in the brain that are spread out over the whole of the brain, that they can be independently erupted. There's, there's, we have a changing system. We are a process. And there's not one unitary self that's carried through from one moment to the next, unchanging. And yet we feel that, that we have this, this self that's just this kind of center of experience. And we don't know the role of consciousness in determining reality. Mm -hmm, even, but mm -hmm. even if you're an evolutionary biologist, and this is so interesting because the evolutionary biologists actually discriminate, differentiated themselves from Darwin on this point. Like Darwin was very, very forthright in his claim that sexual selection was as powerful as natural selection, mm -hmm. or even more so. Mm -hmm. And so that, so here's where this, that goes. And, and because that was, because that brought consciousness into the world as an active player, the materialistic evolutionary biologist ignored that mm -hmm, for like 150 mm -hmm. years and only concentrated on natural selection, where they could play, well, this is all chance. Right. It's like sexual selection is not chance. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you might say, oh, well, it was human female conscious choice that selected us. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you think, well, that's not random. That's not random at all. It's mm -hmm. the farthest thing from random that there is, and that means consciousness is making its choices with mm -hmm. regards to what propagates. But then it's even more complex than that. So here's what happens among men. The men all get together in their hierarchy. They posit a valued goal. They all accept that as the goal, because otherwise they wouldn't be cooperating. Right. Then they arrange themselves into a hierarchy, and they let the most competent guys lead, because they want to get to, they want to, get to the promised land. Mm -hmm. They want to get mm -hmm. the most competent leaders leading. Right. Competent, defined by that value. Okay, so here's what happens, essentially. The men all get together and vote on the good men. And the good men are then chosen by the women, and those are the people who propagate.
And so it's like men are voting on which men get to reproduce. <laughs> and women are going along with the vote mm -hmm. and, and, and being even more stringent in their, in mm -hmm. their choices, let's say. And so then what you get is that the consciousness that through its active expression transforms the potential of the world into actuality also selects the direction of evolution. And so then here's the case you can make. Consciousness extracts the proper world of being from potential through truth, and then it's good. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, that's yeah. a hard one, man. That manifests itself in human beings at the individual level of individual consciousness. That's the logos within. Mm -hmm. That's the metaphysical foundation of the idea of natural right and responsibility. Mm -hmm. okay, that's a bloody killer idea. And also, I think the, the free will argument, I mean, I see why Harris gets tangled up in that, you know, because... Well, first of all, deterministic arguments are unbelievably powerful. And when we use deterministic models for many things, they really work. Right. So you could say, well, we're going to use that by default. It's like, fair enough. We're going to deviate from that with care. But I don't see people as driven like clocks winding down. First of all, we don't wind down in any simple way. We're dissipative structures to use, um, he wrote Schrodinger. What is life? <laughs> a human being is a dissipative structure. We're not... We're not an entropic structure like a clock running down. Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. We are in some sense, but as living beings, we pull energy in. Mm -hmm. And so we're not winding down like a deterministic structure. We're something other than that. And the way we treat each other is as logos, as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. The way I treat mm -hmm. myself, right. if I'm going to be good to myself in the proper sense, is that I'm an active agent of choice confronting an infinite landscape of potential and casting that potential into a reality for good or for evil. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, and if I uh, treat myself that way, then I have proper respect for myself and proper fear of myself because I can make bad decisions and warp the structure of reality. And I think if you read Frankl, for example, mm -hmm. or Solzhenitsyn, and you see how your bad decisions can warp the structure of reality, then that wakes you up, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's that. If you don't treat yourself like an, an active agent, Mm -hmm. imbued with logos, then your life doesn't go well. Mm -hmm. But more, if you don't treat other people that way, they do not want to play with you. If we set up societies that aren't predicated on the idea that people are like that, then the societies become, they dissolve or they become totalitarian almost instantly. So then I would say, well, you've got the, the problem of determinism. It's mm -hmm. like, fair enough, man. How do you reconcile the fact that if you lay out a society at every level of analysis on strict deterministic grounds, it fails. So doesn't, doesn't that mean your hypothesis has a flaw? I do believe that there is such a thing as free will, but by that I do not mean that there is some process that de defies the laws of physical cause and effect. As someone, uh, as my, my colleague uh, Joshua Green once put it, uh, it is not the case that every time you make a decision, a miracle occurs. So I, I don't believe that. Uh, I believe that uh, decisions are made by neurophysiological processes in the brain that respect all the laws of physics. On the other hand, uh, it is true that uh, when I decide what to say next, when I uh, pick an item from a, a menu for dinner, it's not the same as when the, the doctor hits my kneecap with a hammer and my, my, my knee jerks. It's just a different physiological process. And one of them, uh, we use the word free will to, uh, to characterize the more deliberative, um, slower, more complex process by which behavior is uh, selected in the brain. That process uh, involves um, the uh, 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 aggregation of many diverse kinds of information, our memory, our goals, our current environment, our expectation of how other people will judge that action. Those are all information streams that affect that, uh, that, that process. It's not completely predictable in that uh, there may be uh, random or chaotic uh, or um, yeah nonlinear effects that mean that even if you put the same person in the same circumstance multiple times, they won't make the same choice every time. The identical twins who have uh, almost identical upbringings, put them in the same chair, face them with the same choices, they may choose differently. Again, that's not a miracle, 
uh, that, uh, that doesn't mean that there is some ghost in the machine that is somehow pushing the, the, the neural impulses around, uh, but it just means that the brain, like other complex systems, is subject to uh, some degree of, uh, of unpredictability. At the same time, free will wouldn't be worth having and certainly wouldn't be worth extolling in moral discussions if it didn't respond to expectations of reward, punishment, praise, blame. When we say that, we, that someone we're punishing or rewarding someone based on what they chose to do, we, uh, we do that in the hope that that person and other people who hear about what happens uh, will factor in how their choices will be treated by others and therefore they'll be more likely to do good things and less likely to do bad things in the expectation that if they uh, choose uh, beneficial actions, they'll, better things will happen to them. So paradoxically, one of the reasons that we want free will to exist is that it be determined by the, uh, the consequences of those choices. Uh, and on average it does. People do obey the laws more often than not. They, they, they do things that curry favor more often than, than that bring uh, opprobrium on their heads, uh, but not with 100% predictability. So that process is what we call free will. It's uh, different from many of the, the more uh, reflexive and predictable uh, behaviors that we can uh, emit, but it does not involve a miracle. What are we to say about the neuroscientists who are telling the public every day, we've shown in our neuroscience labs that nobody has free will. They should think ser seriously about whether it's irresponsible of them to make these claims about free will. And it's not just a fantasy. Vos and Schooler, in an important paper which has been replicated in several different ways, set up an experiment really to test this with uh, college students who were given two texts to read. One was a text, they were both from Francis Crick's book, The Astonishing Hypothesis, and one was uh, um, not about free will, and the other was about free will, and basically it said, Free will is an illusion. Um, uh, all your decisions are actually uh, determined by causes that, that uh, uh, neuroscience is investigating. You don't have free will, that's just an illusion. All right, so we have two groups, the, the group that read that passage and the group that read another passage from that book of the same length. After they've read the passage, they are given a puzzle to solve where they can earn some money by solving it. And the experimenters cleverly made the puzzle slightly defective, so there was a way of cheating on the puzzle uh, that was, oops, inadvertently revealed to uh, the subjects. And guess what? The subjects who'd read the passage where Crick says free will is an illusion cheated at a much higher rate than the other ones. In other words, just reading that passage did have the effect of making them uh, less concerned about the implications of their actions. And just, they, they became, as it were, negligent or worse in their own decision making. I think that's a, a, an important and sobering thought. Science can explain everything, but it's this basic reflexive transcendental term, but it's nonetheless caught in a circle. I explain this as a natural process causality, but in advance, I already have to approach in this scientific way nature. It's not simply I look around and nature appears like this. Nature. This is the classical Heideggerian point, even. Nature has already to appear to me or to be conceived in this way to me. Like that nature is a causal link or whatever, even with all the further uh, complexities of quantum physics and so on. So the idea is that in order to explain everything, maybe even our brain, our mind through, you already it must be always already here, a certain modern scientific uh, approach, not reproach, sorry, approach to nature. 
and this is then the hermeneutic question, no? Like, uh, uh, but I see problems here. This is the position that many people share, even if they appear to be opposed, from Heidegger to, uh, to uh, deconstructionists and so on. The idea is that you never get, as it were, an innocent view, innocent in the sense that not predetermined with our horizon of understanding of nature. But then the conclusion, and Heidegger was here truly radical, he systematically raised the question here. Uh, what am I saying here is take somebody like Michel Foucault, whom I appreciate greatly. If, sorry if this will be repetitive to you, but uh, he, if you ask him, for example, do we have a free will? His answer would have been, his answer would have been to reject the question in this direct naivety. He would have said, it doesn't matter what answer you give, to raise in its today's meaning this question, you already have to be within a certain episteme. Because in some other approaches to the world, such a question is meaningless. Or is thus natural Determ determ is everything naturally determined by natural causality, or is something that escapes natural causality? Uh, of course, answer would have been, this question itself presupposes a certain approach to reality, where reality appears to you as a nexus of causal uh, effects, chain of effect, causes and effects, and so on. So, for him, this direct ontological question, if you then insist, but fuck you, but what about really? Are we free or not? He would have refused his, this question as too naive. For him, Germans, if you are some Germans here, have this beautiful phrase, I love it, unhintergeber, what you cannot step, move behind. That the further we can go is this, what Heidegger called, I'm oversimplifying here, Lichtung, op openness of being, the way things appear to us. And we cannot step out of it and ask, okay, but how things really are. Because precisely how things really are always appears within a certain horizon and so on and so on.